يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضاء ولك الحمد أبدا 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 والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاءك المنافقون قالوا نشهد إنك لرسول الله والله يعلم إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين لكاذبون اتخذوا أيمانهم جنة فصدوا عن سبيل الله إنهم ساء ما كانوا يعملون اللهم لا تجعلنا منهم رب الشحف صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أمين يا رب العالمين When there is a serious disease outbreak warnings are given out and people are given any means possible and they're reminded over and over again that you need to be careful this is a dangerous disease if you have the following symptoms go see a physician and there are alerts everywhere I remember recently because I used to travel a lot you know uh, when when like the bird flu and swine flu and all this stuff was going around at airports they'd have like free hand sanitizers and extra alerts and if you're sneezing don't travel and this and that and the other depending on how serious a disease is the more panicked a society is, is it gets and rightfully so and if the disease is threatening life threatening then it's even more serious sometimes schools are shut down and people don't go to work and even if they don't have those symptoms if they don't actually have that disease but they have even the most minor instances of that symptom people start thinking maybe they have it and they start siding with caution they get extra careful because I don't want to take any chances you know maybe this is just a cold or maybe this is that crazy deadly disease that they're talking about all over the place and obviously this is a natural response in any society but the disease that I wanted to I, I wanted to introduce this khutbah this way because I want to talk to you about a disease and this is a disease that the believer should be reminded of all the time. And it's a serious disease. And you know, as in, in medical terminology, like they say, some of the most serious conditions you can have is a heart condition. Well, the disease I want to talk to you about is actually a heart disease. And the Quranic term for it is nifaq. We commonly may have heard the term hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. It's a disease. And it's a very serious disease. And for any disease, you have a pathology. You have... Well, first of all, you have what are the, you know, what are the consequences? How bad is it? So what if somebody has hypocrisy? Well, how bad can it be? What are the consequences of this disease? Well, first, let's take a quick look at the consequences. Allah Azza wa tells us in the Qur'an, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النار. The hypocrites, they're in the lowest pit in the hellfire. The lower the hellfire gets, the tougher it gets. And they are in al-asfal, al-darq al-asfal. The lowest pit possible in hellfire is reserved for al-munafiqoon, the hypocrites. Then on top of that, how serious this disease is and how if somebody reaches the terminal stages, you know when there's the early stages of a disease, you can go get treatment. But if it gets to a point of no return, if the disease reaches a point of no return, then you can't be helped. No matter how good the treatment, no matter how expensive the hospital or the doctor, or how advanced the equipment, this person can't be helped. A good friend of mine is a physician. 
And sometimes, and he, he actually works in the ER and stuff, you know, so he sees a lot of like people close to death and he's seen a lot of death. So one, day, one time they had this young man who got into a car accident and he belonged to a very wealthy family, non-Muslims. And they came, you know, they came by private jet from all over the country and they're trying to tell him, we don't care how much money it takes, you need to save his life. And he got to a certain point where basically he was practically dead and he said, there's no, no, no amount of money can save him now. There's, that's beyond us now, this is beyond the attempt of human beings. Now I want to bring that parallel back to hypocrisy. What is the cure? What is the remedy? You know, one of the great gifts in this deen is that the Messenger ﷺ would make dua for a person. You know how sometimes you go to the Imam and you ask him, could you please make dua for me? Or you go ask the elder, could you make dua for me? When somebody's traveling, you say, could you make dua for me? Because the, the, the dua of the traveler is accepted. When somebody's going to Hajj, you make sure you call them and say, make sure you make dua for me. And they'll even come and ask you, any special dua you want me to make for you? Because I'm going there. Now imagine if the Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself is making dua for someone. I would think that would count for a lot. But Allah tells His Messenger وسلم, twice in the Qur'an, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَسْتَغْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ it, it would be the same for these people. These people have reached a point of no return in their hypocrisy. It would be the same for them. Whether you made istighfar for them or you didn't make istighfar for them, meaning if you asked Allah to forgive them, Allah is telling His Messenger وسلم, If you asked Allah to forgive them or you never asked, it wouldn't make a difference, Allah wouldn't forgive them. Allah would not forgive these people. How serious is this disease that even the Messenger's dua وسلم, doesn't make a difference. And in another place in the Qur'an, Allah says, إِن تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ If you ask Allah to forgive them 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. That's a pretty serious disease. And look at the mercy of our Messenger وسلم, When the ayah is revealed, he said, then I'll ask more than 70 times. He's that concerned for his ummah. But nonetheless, the declaration of Allah in its absolute form, that these people are beyond help, even if the Messenger himself was going to make dua specifically for them, even that wouldn't be enough. This is how serious the disease is. But when somebody realizes a disease is serious, the next thing they want to know is, do I have it or not? Do I have the, the sickness or not? And what do I need to look for? In any disease, you look for symptoms. You look for signs in yourself. And these symptoms are not for you to look in anybody else first. Where, do you, where are you supposed to look? For yourself. The only person who doesn't look in themselves is a person who is sure that they can never catch it. They could never possibly get this sickness, it doesn't catch people like them, it catches others. But the thing about nifaq is, the Messenger himself وسلم, gave us an axiom, a principle about our attitude towards hypocrisy. He said, مَا أَمِنَهُ إِلَّا مُنَافِقْ وَمَا خَافَهُ إِلَّا مُؤْمِنْ Nobody feels safe from it, except the hypocrite. And nobody is afraid of it except the believer. So if a person thinks they don't have it, that's a pretty good sign that they do. If a person is really sure that they have no instant, no ounce of hypocrisy in them, that in and of itself seals the deal that they in fact do have hypocrisy, subhanAllah. And another benefit of this hadith is that you stop being concerned about the hypocrisy of others. You become more than anything else concerned about the hypocrisy of yourself. Yourself. And if you find yourself concerned with the hypocrisy of others, that in and of itself is a pretty serious sign. That's a pretty major sign. That you're not as concerned as you need to be about yourself. And I'm not as concerned as I need to be about myself. There are some ulama count more than 70 signs, some count more than 100 signs, some of the more restricted lists I've seen are like 30 signs of a munafiq. 40 signs of a munafiq. If I give you 40 signs of a munafiq, chances are you won't even remember two. So, what I've decided to do in this khutbah, is to at least leave you with no more than six. And if you can remember three or four of them, inshallah ta'ala, it's of benefit. Four of them, four of them, they come from a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, And two of them come from a couple of ayat in the Qur'an, actually the same ayat in Surah At-Tawbah. The ones I want to share with you. So I'll start off with you from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which he says, Ayatul Munafiq, Ayatul Munafiq Thalath. In another narration of this hadith, there are four. In one narration, there are three signs of a hypocrite. So let's just try and remember them, inshaAllah ta'ala, for our own benefit. He says, إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِبًا 
إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِبًا Whenever he speaks, he lies. Whenever he speaks, he lies. If he speaks, there's some element of a lie in it. Whether this lie is to impress someone, or to get out of trouble, or to make someone happy, or out of fear. You know, people lie for different reasons. You get late to work. Your boss says, why are you late? The real reason is you overslept. But you don't want to tell him that. So you say, ah, traffic was pretty bad. You think, ah, it's not that big deal. It's just it's a little, little, little lie, not, not a big deal. You know, you're at work, you're at home and you're like, you know, playing video games or something or browsing something. And your dad walks by and says, what are you doing? You, you know, all tab immediately, ah, homework. You know, doing homework. It's a little lie, not a big deal. Doesn't hurt that much. When he speaks, he doesn't think twice that the fact that I am lying is something major. It's not something small. When you lie a lot, you know what happens? It's not a big deal to you anymore. You don't even realize that you're doing it. It just becomes part of your speech. You don't even think twice about it. You don't even think twice about it. You know? Somebody's calling you on the phone, and you don't want to talk to them. You'd rather finish watching the movie. So you let them go to voicemail, then you send them a text message in a meeting. We'll call you back later. Right? Small, small lies. Not a big deal. You would think it's not a big deal. But as far as this hadith of the Prophet is concerned, sallallahu alayhi wa these little things, they can add up. And they can turn into a sign of hypocrisy. Now there are some instances in which, obviously there are exceptions. There are exceptions in which even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has advised us to make the exception. And this is for the, when there is no harm. Like a, or very specific instances. At least one instance I want to share with you. Your wife made a meal for you. And you take the first bite and it's the taste of death. Right? But she, and she asks you immediately, how is it? Well at that point it's okay for you to say, it reminds me, it's not okay for you to say it reminds me of the Day of Judgment. You could just say it's good. Alhamdulillah. You could, you could stay safe. And you, the safest answer in a situation like that is just say Alhamdulillah. Because that could go either way. Right? So, don't say Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilaihi Raji'un. So, the idea is that you, you, can't, you don't have to lie. But you can, you know, avoid hurting people's feelings in certain situations. But you know, you know yourself very very well, when is it that you're using lying as a shield, and when is it that you're doing it for something good. You know that very well yourself. But this hadith is talking about people that are trying to protect themselves. They're trying to save their own skin. They're trying to get away from some obligation, or get out of trouble, or make someone happy for, for you know, unfair reasons. إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِبَ is the first. He says the second reason he says, or the second sign of the hypocrite, إِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرَ when he's debated with, when he argues with someone, we get into disagreements all the time. You can get into disagreements about little things or big things. You know, people get dis into disagreements about which phone service is better, or which new device is uh, you know, a, a better product, or should you go PC, or should you go Mac, or should you buy American, or Japanese, or German. People get into dumb arguments. But when you get into any discussion, any argument, whether it have to do with something trivial, or it may have to do with business, or family, it may have to do with how you spend your time, whatever it may be. If you, it takes very little for you to explode and become overly angry, this in and of itself is a sign of hypocrisy. When he is argued with, when he's debated, when he's disagreed with, he explodes. Fajr, literally explodes. People are afraid to talk to him because he's like a walking time bomb. He could explode at any time. People know about this person, man, this guy or that one. He's got a temper, she's got a temper. Man, I try to avoid talking to them. Because you never know when it's going to go off. I wouldn't want to be on their bad side. إِذَا خَاصَ مَا فَجَرَ There's a second sign. And here specifically I want to highlight something. The hypocrites, if you, if you look at, if you study the attitudes of the hypocrites in the time of the Prophet wasallam, you learn some things. And one of the things you learn is, you know when they would get the most offended? When something was said to them, that was supposed to be good advice. The hypocrite thinks of good advice as an insult. So when good advice is being given, the hypocrite think, thinks this guy is judging me, he's trying to you know, criticize me in public, he's trying to humiliate me, I'm not going to take that from him. Instead of taking it as good advice, the first thought that goes in the mind of a hypocrite is, why is he talking to me like that? Who are you to talk to me like that? Why should I take your advice? Who do you think you are? Those are the defenses that go up inside the mind of a hypocrite. Actually, I'll give you a sign of, and this kind of paranoia that Allah talks about often in the Qur'an, especially in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, would be, I'm talking about somebody who lies, or somebody who gets, you know, explodes in anger. And maybe one of you knows me, and you're thinking, why is he looking at me like that? 
Is he giving this khutbah about me? Because I think it's about me. Because he keeps giving me that dirty look. I'm not giving any of you a dirty look. But if you have that paranoia, there's a problem. That in and of itself is an indication. Now there's two ways of thinking about that I want to be clear for you. On the one hand, if you're paranoid that I know you and I'm on to you and I'm talking to you specifically, that's a problem. But if you take the advice that's being given I for myself and for you, and you say, you know what, what he's saying applies to me too. And I should take it into consideration. Now that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So the second is, إِذَا خَاصَمَ fajara. He says the third sign. So the first one I'm repeating for you so you remember inshaAllah ta'ala. When he speaks, he lies. When he's argued with, he explodes. When, when he argues, he explodes. إِذَا تُمِنَا خَانَ إِذَا تُمِنَا خَانَ Whenever he's entrusted with something, whenever he's entrusted with something, he violates that trust. You're trusted to do your job right. You're trusted to show up on time and leave on time. You're trusted to take a 30 minute break from work. You're trusted to pay the money back at a certain time. You're trusted to give your employees, send them the check on time. You're trusted with things. You're trusted with things around the house. You're trusted with things at your work, at your business. You're trusted with things within the family. You're trusted with things. There's a trust between a student and a teacher. There's a trust between an employer and an employee. There's a trust. But as soon as you see nobody's watching over my back, you decide, I don't have to take it that seriously. Yes, I've been entrusted with it, but since nobody's watching over me all the time, the moment the security camera is off or my boss is not there, maybe today instead of a 30 minute break, how about a 45 minute break? No big deal, nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna find out. You know why they have punch clocks in offices, right? Because people can't be trusted. If we really were Muslims, and all employees in the company were true Muslims, you wouldn't have punch clocks. There wouldn't be any need to keep record, when did you come in, when did you go? Because people keep their word. When they're trusted with something, they do it. But unfortunately, we're not living in times like that. We're not. When, when something is asked of you, and you're entrusted with something, you don't take it seriously. And that's a major sign of hypocrisy. It's a major, major sign of hypocrisy. You know, إِذَا تُمِنَا خَانَا And finally, وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَا one thing is to be trusted with something. On the, the other is you go out of your way and tell someone you're going to do something. You promise them. إِذَا وَعَدَ He makes a promise. إِدَةٌ in Arabic is a promise. You promise people something. أَخْلَفَ He goes back on his promise. Now going back on the promise here means two things. One, it means he doesn't fulfill it. This person makes a promise, I'll see you, he doesn't see you. I'll call you, he doesn't call you. I'll show up, he doesn't show up, etc. This is a problem. The second part of that is, I never promised you. What are you talking about? You just say flat to somebody's face. What are you talking about? No, 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 I don't owe you anything. I didn't promise you that. You must have heard me wrong. Right? You, so that you conveniently forget, or you make sure the other person must have made a mistake, because you couldn't possibly have made that kind of an obligation, or that kind of, commi- that, that kind of a commitment. إِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ Four serious signs of a hypocrite. In this one hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this, actually the beginning of this hadith is أَرْبَعٌ مَنْ كَانَ فِيهِ فَهُوَ مُنَافِقٌ These four things, whoever has them, then you know that they're a hypocrite. Then they are a hypocrite. And this is not for you to find in somebody else. Once again, I remind you, as you're listening to this, don't be thinking in your head, you know, I, I can think of this one guy, he could have really used this khutbah, because I think he's got all four. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to be thinking about anybody else. You're supposed to be thinking about yourself. The moment you're thinking about anybody else, know that that is a bigger problem than all of these. That's a bigger problem than all because you're not concerned about yourself. So when he speaks, he lies. When he argues, he explodes. When he's trusted with something, he violates the trust. When he promises something, he goes back on the promise. Four signs. And now when we talk about the signs, the two signs I wanted to mention to you from the Qur'an. Very scary signs, I want to conclude with them inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الصَّلَاةَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كُسَالَى وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الصَّلَاةَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كُسَالَى and in this ayah, there are so many gems, so many treasures in this part of the ayah. Allah didn't even say they established the prayer. You know about the believers, Allah says all the time, they established the prayer, يُقِيمُونَ salata. They established the prayer. He says, وَلَا يَأْتُونَ salat. They don't even come to the prayer, coming to the prayer, إِلَّا وَهُمْ kusala, Except that they're lazy. What the ayah is telling us is, even the hypocrite comes to the prayer. He comes to the prayer. But what Allah is criticizing is not that he comes to the prayer, but he comes to it lazily. The, the way in which he comes to the prayer is lazy. Oh my God, salah time again. Oh, it's cold, I gotta make wudu again. 
I just put my socks on. Now take them off. You know, it's like a nuisance for you. It's like it's getting in your way. You have other things to do with your schedule, and it's kind of this, you know, uh, unscheduled stop in your day. And sometimes some of you, they're not used to praying. Some of you don't pray regularly. And you end up by the qadr of Allah and the company of others who are regular in their prayer, and you're together hanging out, and somebody says it's salat time, and you're the first feeling that goes through you is discomfort. Oh my God, I gotta pray now with these guys. Because if I don't pray, they're gonna be like, why are you not praying? You know? And there's this laziness that takes over you on the inside. That's a pretty serious sign of the munafiq. We're, we're supposed to be zealous towards the prayer. And the attitude Allah gives us, you know, if you think of your day like a calendar, Allah Azza wa says to us, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Allah says the prayer has been declared over the believers as Allah that keeps their time. In other words, the, the, the calendar of a Muslim is based on the salah. I'll see you at Asr time, I'll see you right before Luhr time, we'll pray together. Let's have a meeting after Maghrib. Our calendar, our schedule is salat. All the other activities we do are secondary, they can move. Like you know in a house, my teacher used to give the example, in a house you have, a, you have pillars. You can move the furniture, what can you never move? The pillars. You can move all the other schedule, you can move all the other things in your day. The things you cannot move is what? Is salat. You come to it and don't come to it lazy. kusala. And the final sign, the sixth sign that I wanted to share with you today, is wala yunfiquna illa wahum karihun. They don't spend except that they regret it, that they don't like it. They don't spend. By, by the ayah, it refers to spending here, spending in the sake of Allah. That's the primary meaning. Spending for the sake of Allah. Giving sadaqah, giving even the oblig obligatory and beyond. So there's the sadaqah, and of course the obligatory, the zakah. Nothing comes out of their pocket for the sake of Allah, except they think twice about it. And then in their mind, they run the entire accounting. This money could have gone there, 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 there. You know, when a call is being made to give something for the sake of Allah, and relax, this is not a fundraiser, right? When, when the call is being made to give something for the sake of Allah, the first thing that goes in your mind is, man, what about the groceries this week? The electricity bill? I haven't paid the car insurance for the next six months. Tuition for college, the house payments, you know, the lawnmower, this and that. Oh my God, you're, you, all of a sudden you become a CPA. The moment you have to write a check for the sake of Allah. But when you go to Walmart and you start throwing things in your, in your, you know, in your shopping cart, you don't think twice. When you go to GameStop and you're buying a video game, you don't think twice. You're like, you don't think, oh, college tuition, lawnmower. None of that goes through your head. It's all good, I'll take care of it. It'll work itself out. I got this. You know? When you leave an extra tip for the waiter at the restaurant, it's all good, I got this. When it comes to giving for the sake of Allah, immediately shaitan comes. Immediately he comes. And he tells you, listen, you need to think about this man. You need this money. You could be doing so much more with it. So Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرُ Shaitan promises you poverty. When you're thinking about losing your money when you give for the sake of Allah, then you should know that shaitan at work. That's, you should know that shaitan at work. And the hypocrite has developed that attitude so much, they don't even think it's shaitan, they think it's themselves. وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كَارِهُونَ And this karihun is ism fa'il. I, I don't want to get grammatical with you, but very briefly, this, the use of the noun here suggests they're always like that. Never, never comes a time in their life that they have to give for the sake of Allah and they don't think twice, that they don't like it. And even after they give, they're like, man, I just, I wish I could just, you know, somehow cancel the payment or go back or, you know, that their regret is going on afterwards. SubhanAllah. These are six pretty serious signs of a munafiq. And I told you in the beginning, in the beginning I told you the consequences of this disease, right? I told you that they're in the lowest pit of the fire, and even the Prophet asking for forgiveness wouldn't, wouldn't be enough for them, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But in the end, I want to leave you with one of the other consequences of hypocrisy, that doesn't happen in the akhirah, it happens in the dunya. It doesn't happen in the next life, it happens in this life. This is something Allah tells His Messenger to sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Surah At-Tawbah. He says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا Allah says, don't be impressed. The he, he tells His Messenger وسلم, don't be impressed with their money and don't be impressed with their kids. Because for a hypocrite, all they figure is, I'm gonna keep this money for what? 
for, my, for myself, my building my assets, and I'm going to put my kids through a good school, and I'm going to give them a good career, etc. And even here when we say, awladuhum, it's not like it's bad for you to take care of your kids. But when you only worry about the dunya of your kids, and none, never the thought crossed in your mind that I should be giving these children, like Ibrahim gave his children, some concern about where, where they're going to end up, how they're going to raise a family of their own, an ethical character. I shouldn't give them, I just need to give them a good education. Allah says about them, don't be impressed with them. Allah only intends to torture them by means of it. By means of what? Their money and their children. Torture them by means of their money and their children in this world. In this world. I've met people that came to this country, good Muslims. Good Muslims, when they came to this country, the doors to the haram are wide open, and the halal option is really small, and it's far away. So they chose to make some compromises in their life. And they chose to become people that don't care, care too much about salah, and don't care too much about giving. And they just became self-indulged. And then they became very successful in their businesses, and they put their kids through colleges, very good colleges. And you know what, these are the same people sitting in the audience, sometimes they're crying. Because they're saying, what have I done with my kids? They don't even talk to me. Forget talking to Allah, they don't even talk to me. They don't even look back. I, I gave my life for them. I gave everything for them. I worked in grocery stores and I drove a cab and I did all this stuff for them. The only thing I didn't give them is deen. And look what happened. Now that same money that I exhausted my youth to save for them, the money's become a source of torture and they've become a source of torture for me. That's all they've become. This is a punishment of Allah in this dunya. I've seen it to, with so many people, the sadness in their eyes when they talk about their children. Wallahi. Wealthy families. I go, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to go to many communities across the country. I meet these people. They're so wealthy. They're so well off. Their children are, went to the best schools. They're lawyers and engineers and doctors. They're working in high branches of government, etc. And yet they say, my, my son, you know, he doesn't talk to me. What should I do? You know, what can I do? And if you just sit there and ask, how were you raising your children? What kind of life were you living? When did you start coming to the masjid to begin with? Even for Jum'ah? You'll find some really interesting answers. You know? And people don't make the connection. Many of you sitting in the audience are young and your children are young. This, this issue of not living a life of hypocrisy is not just important for you. It leaves a legacy for generations to come. Understand that. This is a very serious matter for all of us. Islam is not automatic over here. It's not on autopilot. We have to actively keep it alive. This is a country where Islam is being pulled away from us all the time. So you have to be extra involved. It's not like when you were living back home. Where you can say, it's all good, we're in a Muslim country, the next generation will be Muslim, what's the big deal? No, 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 no. It's not like that. We have to become very aware Muslims. And we have to raise very aware Muslim children. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us recognize and fight the causes of hypocrisy. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the ability to strengthen our iman and remove this disease from our hearts. And may Allah not raise us on judgment day among those who were hypocrites. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikri al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhi nasrafa خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن يقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا